From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This evening, folks, we are returning to a bit of a continuing obsession, legendary mysterious fighters uh, from ages past. Uh, Please do check out our earlier series on assassins and our recent recent episode on the Knights Templar, but tonight, this evening, we're asking a question that has haunted Western history for centuries. What on earth were the Viking Berserkir? Were they real? Here are the facts. I mean, before we do any of this, we have to talk about the Vikings, because those guys got a, um, they're very popular in pop culture, but uh, I think they got a short shrift in the historical record. Remember that song? And uh, I think it was Clerks or it's Jay and Silent Bob. And he's like, something, 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 some berserker. <laughs> do, 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 berserker. They say some naughty words in there. But I think that was the first time I heard the word berserker. I guess it's a very metal concept, which makes sense for Vikings. It stays with us, you yeah. know, like uh, you'll you'll occasionally hear in uh, modern English, uh, you'll hear somebody went berserk. And mm-hmm. it's uh, it's sometimes a compliment, but it all harkens back to, again, this uh, thing that is sometimes described as the special forces of the Viking culture. And I think to really understand this, to get into it, we kind of have to talk about the Vikings. Like before we went on air today, we were uh, just shooting the breeze as we do before we record. And we we're talking about music that we like you were saying, Noel, we're talking about music that uh, we found hearkening back to the Berserkers. Uh, Matt, what was that? What was that song you hipped us to? I was from, uh, I think you say Donheim, D A N H E I M. Uh, the name of that song was, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. It's whispered in the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ufenar. I don't know how to say it right. Ufenar, something like that. Um, they say like Ulfian not it's very interesting. It's just it's this music that it's Norse folk music and it goes deep into my body and it resonates something that's in there that you guys it kind of makes me nervous like bro I it it sends shivers through my body. I get goosebumps and I feel like warmth. I'm like, what are you awakening in me, bro? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you shared a song. What was that one? Oh, Hai Long. Yeah. The, uh, so <laughs> there, is a, there is a bit of a like How Stuff Works backstory to that. So uh, we are people with uh, abiding interest in very weird, specific things. That is true. That is known. And the song we were sharing there is called Hilong Norupo, uh, N-O-R-U-P-O. Uh, it is a reenactment uh, or a, a song inspired by the idea of religious ceremonies occurring before a conflict. Yeah, dude, there's something dude. in there. There's oh, something man. in there. Well, speaking of stuff that gives shivers, does this ring a bell, guys? Ah! Yes. <laughs> we come from the land of the ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the hot springs flow. The hammer of the gods will drive our ships to new lands to fight the horde, sing and cry. Valhalla, I am coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. And a Killer lot of this imagery. A, a lot of this is inspired by this actual group, this culture that did exist. Uh, Vikings are legendary in their own right. If you're looking at the facts, uh, these folks were a seafaring culture from what we would call Denmark, Norway, and Sweden today. Why do we keep calling them legendary? Why do they inspire so much Western uh, culture? And indeed, why do they inspire so much Eastern anime? Shout out to the nerds in the crowd. It's because 
we don't know a ton about them. Like even the etymology, okay, this is a bit of a ride, but please go with me here. Even the etymology of the word Viking is uncertain. The prevailing scholarly conclusion is that it comes from the old Norse word Vikingir, which usually is taken to mean pirate or raider, oh. which makes sense because yep. they raided a ton of places. Yeah, uh, and you can see that that reflected in the imagery of popular culture, right? When you if you close your eyes and you imagine a Viking, mm -hmm. for me, it's on a ship, one of those uh, very characteristically quote Viking ships, and they are on their way to shore to perform a raid, right? That's mm -hmm. like I think that's the thing we see. We were talking about the Assassin's Creed. Uh, what has it been? Valhalla. Uh, the imagery on the front of that game. And just how that is the quintessential version, at least that the West, the way the West portrays uh, what a Viking is. And a lot of us, of course, are thinking of Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. Sure. In, uh, in, in, or the in, Ride uh, of the Valkyries. Yeah, yeah. I Shout mean, out Wagner. Wagner, indeed. He was fascinated by that, too, for some maybe problematic reasons. There's also a what? lot of no associations way. with Vikings <laughs> with, uh, you know, um, white supremacy. You know, mm -hmm. that good stuff. What? No way. Yeah, it's true. It's Get true. out of here with those conspiracy theories. Well, no, Noel it, is absolutely correct, by the way. He is, but it is an image of th that type of human being in a form of power right perfection and, and almost you know? and fear yeah. too we're well, gonna get into yeah. that right mm -hmm. a yeah. symbol of fear the hyperborean concept that would later inform uh inform a lot of racist Aryan ideologies right so uh i i do have a pitch for favorite etymological theory on the vikings uh the word's origin could be traced to old english and old frisian uh vicin with a W or Visine also with a W. Uh, and these words are about 300 years older than the old Norse words. And if this theory is true, there's an if then game, then Visine and Visine probably derive from Vic, which is related to the Latin word Vicus, which means village or habitation. So logically, we could say that Viking ultimately means, Paul, I don't know if we can afford the sound cue, but here we go, the village people. Nice. <laughs> no, they're, it's they're the fun homies. to raid at the YMCA. Yeah. They're like wow. a brotherhood. <laughs> it's, it is funny, too. I always go down these silly, um, usually incorrect etymological rabbit holes, but the German word for white is Weiss. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so just kind of just throwing that out there. That's it's kind of blowing my mind, Ben, because I'm getting an image of what we're going to talk about here with the Berserker specifically. Some of the... Um, Bare chested, B A R E, chested fighting, some of the like almost not sexualized, but the very, um, I, I don't know, bare male masculinity going into battle, uh, because there's some form of invulnerability perceived by like having fewer clothes and armor mm. on. Hyper chads. And then just now I'm just imagining <laughs> that like vibe that you get from the band, the village people. <laughs> yeah. just, hmm. Okay. Yeah, they were a group of renegade folklorists before they began. <laughs> I think so. Their, their boy band. So for I, I like it too. We're gonna see all these threads come together in a in a weird tapestry in tonight's episode from the late eighth century CE to about the late uh, 11th century, so like right when the Crusades are popping off, Vikings are this massive expansionary force. These guys were all over the place. These men and women, by the way, uh, were all over the place raiding, but they were also trading. They were also settling and attempting to create new, um, new communities for their culture. They got so far. They went to the Mediterranean, North Africa, the Middle East. They were probably the first Europeans to create a settlement in North America. They called Newfoundland, uh, Vinland, or Winland. And uh, this was once treated as a conspiracy. Turns out it's true. One more quick line from that Zeppelin song. On we sweep with thrashing ore. Our only goal will be the western shore. I mean, come on. It's like the image yeah. is there. Dude, I, what was that episode 
we did where we were looking back at early North American um, exploration outside of indigenous peoples that w- the, it was a wa- gosh, I can't remember the name of it. You'll have to like search back through our, <laughs> our shows, but we, we covered um, theories about early, early expansion into what we call North America now by um, people who would be maybe described in this way, like Norse, Viking, whatever. Um, fascinating. There are fascinating potential artifacts that, that date back to that time. Yeah, man. Also, uh, my favorite, like, uh, hanging out off air conspiracy there is the idea that what was it? Eric the Red conspired to mislead people in his explorations by calling the, the icy waste Greenland. Yeah. And by calling the one place you could live up there, oh, right. Iceland, yeah. it was don't, a trick, Don't go right? there. Don't go yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's so fun. I always forget about it's that. It's not the most beautiful place you've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> right, right. It's no Svalbard Island. But for centuries, Vikings were pretty misunderstood. For a lot of us, as uh, Noel, Matt, and I have described today, and as you are doubtlessly imagining in your mind, there is a very clear imagistic association, evocation, when you hear the word Viking, like a hairy, horned helmet wearing, marauder, murdering and pillaging his or her way up the European coast in this just like endless cycle of raids and mercenary violence. And usually the villain in those cases is portrayed as illiterate, uncultured, barbaric. But here's the thing. That's not entirely true. Vikings did make inscriptions in runes, but a lot of it was like graffiti. Some of the earliest graffiti, in fact, is uh, it translates to English as something like Vugnar was here <laughs> and it's in <laughs> runes. <laughs> and, and because uh, literacy, as we understand it, was very late to the Viking game, a lot of the history about Vikings was written centuries later by descendants of their victims, their rivals, their enemies. It's kind of like stories about the Knight Templar, to be honest. I can see the similarities there. It really goes back to the scant amount of historical uh, artifacts, right? The actual things written down, actual things, uh, what, uh, chiseled into stone somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's like a couple. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) There's stuff like, there's stuff like, Eric is cool. And then, who was Eric? Uh, mm-hmm. Cue the uh, History Channel. Eric but, with a K, no doubt. Eric with a K, no yeah. doubt. But, but, like, you know, these, these folks didn't just, like, randomly decide to rape and pillage their way across the globe. Like, there were real reasons, functional reasons for this expansion, right? Yeah, I love that you point that out, man, because... Uh, history loves a, a very clear good and a very clear bad, and unfortunately, that's not how the real world works. The Viking communities, what we call the Viking uh, culture, that expansion, that cycle of raids and pillaging, it was triggered by multiple social factors, uh, and I, I would say also uh, ecological factors, uh, overpopulation, resource demand at home, and then also again, they're not like the super best people there. They were noticing that nearby communities or cultures that they could touch with their uh, naval acumen. Those communities were also struggling with similar domestic problems. They were surviving in the wake of chaos, the wake of instability. They were easy to uh, get. And so they got got. Do you guys think that because of the nature of just survival and the difficulty of living in this type of time, that there would have been maybe a shorter supply of quote unquote good people because people didn't have the luxury of being good? It was very dog eat dog. I just, I I don't know. I I think about this sometimes. It's a good question. I mean, to answer that, we would have to put in the piece of uh, xenophobia. Like, what do you consider also a peer member of humanity? And that's something that humans continue to struggle with today. Uh, Thankfully, one good thing about the age of ubiquitous information is that there are slightly more opportunities for empathy. But to your point, Noel, um, in terms of good or bad, that's often sort of a tin plate rationalization. The idea of absolute good and absolute bad is 
kind of a convenience. The stuff of stories too, really. Mm-hmm. It's an easy narrative device, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, you're, you're just a regular farmer, like everybody else. You're just a humble farmer, like in that excellent <laughs> film. We got a couple of emails oh, it's about a film recently. Now. Okay. It's up. You've upgraded it. <laughs> As a, what do we I'm call joking. it? Early? I think you know, it's, a, it's a movie. <laughs> He's a humble farmer. Boy, is he ever. <laughs> so, How humble can he get? So uh, imagine you're this person and, you know, you're you're breaking your heart over uh, growing whatever crop you can grow. Millet. And then all of a sudden in the distance, you hear a deep resonant horn. Uh, Paul, can we get a scare? Perfect. And then you hear like howling. Paul, can we get some howling? Make it animals. Yeah. And then you look out across the coast and you see some ships. That's how people encountered Vikings. So no wonder they thought they were monsters and maybe not quite human. They look like monsters with those outfits, right? I mean, if you're at at a place of superstition, this invading horde that you've never witnessed before, they're literally decked out with devilish kind of get-ups, and you might well believe that they're supernatural or not of this world. But but again, is that actually how they were dressed when they came through and how much of that is myth how much of that is psychological force projection which we have is artifacts though of these type of things don't we these horns some of them the historical record is pretty uh pretty scant again like the horned helmets just don't make a lot of sense in realistic combat like it's there's a reason that most of the mma fighters you know and most of the boxers you know don't have long hair. They don't have a bunch of stuff on their head because in, when you are in melee situations or melee situations, that's an opportunity to grab something and introduce you to a kneecap, you know? It's true. They, uh, so the, uh, they probably, I don't know about the kneecaps, but anyway, uh, like horned helmets, we know they became, it's kind of like how Coca-Cola made the image of Santa Claus, right? Uh, The horned helmets association with Vikings, there are some ancient artifacts, horns primarily, like horns like Paul just played, uh, that have some engravings of people who appear to have horns. But uh, the idea of all Vikings wearing horns on their helmets as a uniform comes about because of Wagner. It comes about specifically in 1876 because Wagner had a costume designer named Carl Emil Doppler, and Carl was great at costumes. Maybe not so much historical accuracy. Well, either way, th- what we do know is that they are get-ups, whatever they may have been exactly. They were going for a show of force and uh, yes. intimidation. And I think that uh, Eggers film, The Northman, he's mm-hmm. really well known for really getting historical details right. Like in The Witch, they used like old English texts and stuff for the dialogue. But I've read in, in multiple places that the visuals of like they had like their teeth would be engraved into like and it's a they got that detail in the film and a lot of the outfits and, and armor and stuff. No horns, I don't, I don't believe in the film uh, are apparently pretty period accurate. Mm-hmm. And it also depends like period accuracy is, is tricky because um, like even unto whether or not Viking communities had tattoos, we know the technology was present, but we don't know whether they engaged in it. Because again, when you have a community that is only putting written records in runes, then you're kind of like trying to base your understanding of a culture on their graffiti. It's sort of like asking, you know, um, (laughs) it's sort of like, it's sort of like saying, Hey, uh, you're a historian hundreds of years in the future. What can you tell us about America? The only record we have, by the way, is stuff written in barroom bathrooms. (laughs) So like, (laughs) you know, there's a, there's an emphasis then on perhaps the wrong thing. These folks were crass. (laughs) <laughs> these of, folks, a lot of ding dongs. <laughs> these folks had a love of phallus, yeah. And not every, obviously, not every Norse person was a Viking. Just like how most of the Templars at their height were not warrior monks. You know, there was a lot of infrastructure. I mean, the the Blood Eagle thing is probably super embellished. Oh, uh, the nicknames like Ivar the Boneless. 
uh, and <laughs> Ragnar Harry breaches. Those Ooh. were made up years and years after those biological humans were long gone. Typos, mistranslations, misunderstandings. There's one legend that we think deserves closer scrutiny. What about the Berserkir? What about the Berserkir? Yeah. yeah. Now, before we get to that, Ben, you, you yeah. said Blood Eagle. Let's just quickly describe it. Um, oh, yeah. If you're That's listening gnarly. to this and you've got kids in the car or something, skip forward 15 seconds. What's the or Blood Eagle? Or if you eagle? squick easily. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the Blood Eagle, as uh, popularized by the History Channel... <laughs> It's weird, right? <laughs> right. By the History Channel's uh, program, The Viking, uh, or just Vikings, I think. It is, according to the stories, it's a method of ritual execution. And it's it's laid out in the written record in poetry, which is open to interpretation. But the idea is, help me here, guys. The idea is that you would sever the ribs of your victim from the spine, right? With some sort of bladed instrument. Yes, with someone and, laying down on their stomach, basically. Right. And then you would pull their lungs back and out and stretch them such that they created a pair of grisly wings. If you want to see it depicted uh, pretty grislily, it's in the film uh, Midsommar by Ari Aster. Um, no spoilers as to who receives the Blood Eagle, but it is very much fully on display. Mm -hmm. And when you get introduced to the characters in Midsommar, you're Do ready us a for favor. them to get ice. Yeah, just guess which one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll that'll make it even Most better. Most of them are pretty despicably obnoxious. So, how would we describe berserkers specifically? Because they were not your average Vikings, according to the stories. Maybe what you might think of as a tank in a D and D party, right? The biggest and burliest, or of, um, of like a barbarian, similar yeah, barbarian. to a barbarian, but not the same. A two-handed weapon wielder, right? Yeah, maybe. Sometimes they might have a shield. You know, sometimes they might have two little hatchets. Sometimes they might have a big battle axe. Uh, the sometimes main thing they is, might be nude, right? The main <laughs> thing is they're naked. The main uh, thing is you can see their junk. Oh, wow. Uh, so they well, are, uh, it, they're, they're clad it, in <laughs> animal skins, right? Conventionally, it's a, supposed to be a bear skin, but it may also be any other large predator. So um, we know Viking communities respected bears, but also wolves, also, you know, large wild dogs. And and the thing with those guys is they are so 10 toes down. They are so paws down on this that when it is time to tangle, they kill whomever is in front of them, even a friendly force. They're just swinging. They're, they're like bullets, you know, and the, uh, and the ships like the gun. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, but like they li likely many of them wouldn't survive because of their lack of armor. They really were almost like kamikaze type situations, you know. Um, and again, uh, just to, to reference the uh, the North, the Northmen, they take a lot of psychedelics in that film. A lot of like weird, un, you know, described psychedelic herbs or whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these berserkers were also hopped up on some kind of go go juice. That's the idea. The main Main differentiation you've hit on it is that they encounter some sort of disassociative mental state, a fugue, a trance that um, gives them temporarily something like a, a super soldier Captain America esque abilities. They take damage that would incapacitate the average person, indeed, the average Viking. They continue to fight on and they don't stop. Until the battle is done, the trance leaves, and if and then they're weak, you know, they're out of it. Uh, we would say shock, I think most medical professionals would call it these days. Uh, and if they do survive, if they do not succumb to their wounds, they also have short form amnesia, they have no recollection of what just happened. So imagine it's like the trope from every Western werewolf film, right? Or most of the, I would say the good Western werewolf films, they wake up and they, uh, they're covered in blood yeah. and they're like, Eric, what, what the heck? And he's like, <laughs> good job, dude. And, and it, this is all amazing imagery. It, uh, it, we are describing 
the story yes. of a berserker, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the myth yeah. or the legend or the thing that is out there, right? As what this thing is or could be, we're not describing historical, you know, berserkers. The the image, yes, mm -hmm. the brand, which will become important later over the centuries. Scholars wondered whether these warriors were an exaggeration, a fabrication, maybe a secret group of drug users, maybe a religious sect, or wait, what? Were they even real? It's a question we'll answer after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Yes, I mean, something like the Berserker was a real thing. Like, there were definitely Viking warriors. We know that. That happened. They raided a ton of people. You can trace that in the DNA of Scandinavia. Yeah, the word uh, itself uh, is often thought to arrive from Old Norse berserker, which is with without the e, uh, which translates roughly to bear shirt. But like many of the things involved in this tale, uh, not everyone agrees. You'll often hear folks argue that berserker actually means bear shirt. <laughs> Like A R E, like Matt was uh, was alluding to earlier, or bare chested. Um, once again, implying the thing we mentioned about them, you know, going in commando. Yeah, and like you said, classic D and D barbarian inspiration. For anybody who is interested in playing Dungeons and Dragons, what you need to know is that your barbarian character does better when they don't have a ton of armor. If you mm. want armor, you're looking for fighter class, paladin couple types of cleric but the you gotta uh, put points into armor you know like uh it's a thing like it, it in and of itself is a, a superpower that you got to kind of cultivate throughout the game yeah depends on depends on the game i th i think that's largely accurate and speaking of depending on the game when we're playing the game of historical accuracy we quickly find that berserkers as a concept sort of move back and forth over the boundary of fantasy and fact. There's a lot of speculation about these guys. There's a lot of strange stuff out there. And because some of these stories were created so long ago, more than a thousand years ago, uh, these they're treated as though they are fact, right? Uh, you can see sources, numerous sources that claim Berserkers had superhuman powers, you know, like you could cut off a leg. Oh, crap, he's still coming. You know, how is he hopping like that? How is he dangerously hopping toward me? Th yes. Think about how strategically advantageous that would be if you could seed those stories into the mythology of your army, right? So then when you do show up, when those horns do sound off in the distance, right? And you, you see that there are ships heading your way and you've heard stories about that very sound and you know what's on that ship. It's these berserker guys who are going to get off, you know, get off that ship and just immediately go ham on everything in sight. <laughs> That's like, that is terrifying. Yeah, there may be 300 of you. But you're all usually farmers. There may be only, you know, 150 other like operators on this ship, but you've heard the stories. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe it only takes one. And even if I do somehow lop off a leg, like you're saying, this guy's not going to stop. <laughs> it's and just so, so funny to me. He's like the most dangerous pogo stick in Europe at this point. <laughs> but, but just that what it would do to effectively have people throw down whatever weapons or, or tools they had and just GTFO. And there's a very sparsely inhabited village now that this ship rolls up onto because you've, you've scared everybody off like well in advance of actually arriving. It's pretty smart. And we know that most people throughout history, given the opportunity to learn are incredibly intelligent. I mean, also it's funny to me that even in, what we know about Viking communities, the berserker class is typically not going to be considered the cream of the social crop. They're in Norse sagas, like in the old school Norse sagas, 
uh, scholars often interpret villains as berserker characters, and it all goes back to the penchant for killing their own. Like, oh, there's not a war? I'm just hanging out in town? Well, screw this guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, aren't there stories of them actually uh, kind of incorporating themselves into like a, a nobility? So like into yes. the king's circle or whatever, mm-hmm. so that it's almost like I imagine at least from the royalty's perspective, having that weapon you're talking about, right? And not a nuke necessarily, but a, or a tactical nuke that but you could launch. But it is early mad, yeah. Right? So if, you, if you've if you got a couple berserkers on your team that you could send in if you wanted to, it would be, again, a, for me, it's all about the psychological bit where if, if some other king just uh, across the way knows that you've got a couple berserkers on lock, uh, they're like, no, nah, I'm... I don't want to mess with that guy. Well, okay. So, Berserkers, why are you the way you are? What made you this way? <laughs> yeah, why are you so damn yeah. mean? At this point, there's no there's no hard proof, no conclusive proof of what informed this legendary brutality. And we owe a big, uh, a big thanks to Peter Pence, who is the curator of Danish prehistory at the National Museum of Denmark. And Denmark's National Museum is one of the best sources on Viking lore and uh, Viking history. And so what he he points out, some of the things we mentioned earlier, Pence says, again, this phenomenon of berserkers, it's primarily known from written medieval era sources, not from the Vikings themselves. One of the first written records of what we would call berserkers comes from an Icelandic historian who lived around 1200. So again, several centuries after this era of berserkdom had passed. (laughs) And uh, this guy, his real name is Snorri Sturlson. That's not a real name. That's his real name. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It makes sense. It tracks. He was Icelandic and lived around 1200 CE. Got it. And he writes that the Berserkers uh, were a, uh, a type of uh, almost monk warrior in a way, at the very least, uh, imbued with Odin's wrath and his power and blessing or what have you. Uh, he says that Odin's own men went to battle without coats of mail and acted like mad dogs or wolves. Wolves. They bit their shields and were as strong as bears or bulls. A lot of animal uh, illusions here. Uh, they killed people and neither fire nor iron affected them. This is called Berserker Rage. <laughs> there, well, it, you get into that spiritualism thing. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of it goes back to this concept that uh, re- like being naked, at least to some extent when in battle, showed your enemies that you at least felt invulnerable. And mm-hmm. if some of them believed some of the legends, they thought you were invulnerable. Ben's talking about the leg. I keep thinking about the Pogo guy again, but the, just that concept, right? Gosh, that like, I don't know. There's some, there's something to that that goes so deep in this, in the spiritual side, in the like, a like a holy warrior of some well, sort and protected aspect. by the gods I of mean, nature itself yeah. Well, right yeah, yeah. yeah. improved by zeus you i know think the that's psychos, a lot used in the earlier thing you know the psychos that do elden ring builds where they're basically nude you mm-hmm. know With the it's such a flex yeah. man the you know? i mean that's uh, well, that's my second character by the I way i thought it was <laughs> you monster Are you solo um uh also there's a um, there's another thing i want to point out here too uh the idea of fighting nude as a psyop still occurs in the modern day. It's, if uh, you freak it, people look, out, that's for sure. Ooh. At this point, if I ever get in a street fight, that's the first thing I'm doing. Strip. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay, so here I'm going to give you a tip. And okay. This is this is not. Um, I shouldn't even say tip, but this Keeps is the boxers on. Or the, this is the, no. The this is not to play along. <laughs> this okay. Let me put it this way without compromising anybody. Imagine again, you're that farmer, and the uh, the Vikings are running at you. You hear the horn. Thanks, Paul. You hear the howls. Thank you, Paul. And then the people running at you are not just naked and screaming and howling at animals, but they have visible erections. Yeah. They're oh, horny for on. battle, baby. All right. I'm going to work on that one. We'll see where we go. All right. <laughs> maybe maybe just don't get into fights. Uh, that's the best way to handle a fight. 
is to avoid it in the first place. Can but, you, oh gosh, I'm just picturing the <laughs> sexual now violence. Now you're picturing it. Yeah. Well, I'm picturing oh, the sexual oh, violence yeah. that may have occurred on the battlefield yeah. too, Absolutely. in the midst Absolutely. of it, oh, covered God. in blood. I mean, it's mm -hmm. some gnarly stuff. Oh. Shout out to Judge Holden uh, for any fans of uh, Blood Meridian. So, so to pence this idea from our Icelandic historian way, way back, it's interesting because it has two interpretations of Berserker. One, fighters who go to battle clad only in animal skins. And then two, fighters who have some sort of preternatural, supernatural strength. And the question that we've been obviously quarreling with, because we are all grown-ups, is why would you go into battle butt naked? It's, it's the PSYOP aspect. It always has been. It's such a potent psychological weapon. If you're on the other side and you've never encountered these people, if you're an enemy on the other side, you're thinking, these guys are bonkers. They don't give a F. And uh, it shows, it shows like, again, you know, if you've ever been in a fight or an interrogation where the first thing you do is harm yourself in front of your enemy to establish the stakes of oh, the yeah. encounter, then that's what's happening here. Like, the, if they don't care about their own personal safety, what do they think about yours? Are they indeed are they indeed invulnerable due to the favor of a god? It's like when someone in a film or something allows themselves to take a brutal beating and just, like, eggs them on, you know, just to show that I'm insane, you know? I, I'm, tr I, I'm thinking about everything you guys are saying. I'm, I'm trying to find uh, instances of a fencyclidine uh, or PCP, like a similar chemical that occurs in sure. nature or something. Mm -hmm. Like, is I don't know if there is anything. I'm, I can't find it in the moment, at least. But, like, something <laughs> like that that would offer that dissociative thing we talked about, but also mm -hmm. the altered state to where pain perception goes way mm -hmm. down, right? Yeah. And all the things we're describing here. We have drugs at home, says the human brain, right? Like you can, you can create, we'll, we'll get to that part. You can okay. create that. Uh, the, the thing is also, we have to bust a little bit of a myth. These guys probably weren't just running around butt naked with boners. They had weapons, they had shields. And according to Peter Pence, again, one of the best sources on this, uh, Wolfskin and bearskin do offer some protection against bladed weapons. I just, not as much as armor, but also on a financial standpoint, uh, it's easier to, at this point, to kill an animal and wear its skin than it is to craft armor, which is quite expensive in terms of resources, time, and finance. Really quickly, too, back to the potential drugs that they might have been taking. I found a, an interview with uh, with uh, David Eggers, the director of The Northman, where he talks about the historical evidence uh, of this. And it's something called henbane. Henbane seeds uh, were found in some Viking graves uh, of, of folks who were known to be seeresses or witches. The vulva. Right, the vulva. that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. vulva. And you can tell which direction we're heading in. Fellow conspiracy realists, we're going to take a pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we're going to explore the most legendary part of the story, the origins of the Berserker Rage. <laughs> We've returned. Over the centuries, there have been multiple theories about this legendary rage or what could have originally inspired it. In general, we can trace it to three primary paths of speculation. And to be completely clear, as a bit of a disclaimer, there's some sticky stuff in here. Uh, we're not personally condoning it, nor do we personally agree with it, but you need to know the scholarship. The first one is religious fervor. Like, what if these guys just got so hyped up, right? Inner circle of Odin. We are, you know, we are the tip of the spear. We are fighting not for ourselves, but for something larger. Indeed, our God. Could that have inspired this rage? Could you have been so consumed by this idea that you would have been able to ignore grievous injury? like losing a hand, you know, like the God tear, uh, or, you know, losing a leg or something like that. I mean, it's, I, I'm going back to the Templars episode. 
it feels similar to that, right? Where if you have enough conviction about your purpose of or the purpose of battle in the moment and in general, I think you I think the human mind can go past a lot mm-hmm. of things like that. Limits. Yeah. Physicality. I mean, belief is a hell of a drug, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's surprising too uh, the association of bears and wolves with elite warriors in what we call Scandinavia today, uh, that far predates the age of Vikings. In the beginning, it appears that this idea of a religious warrior, berserker level, was linked to uh, the concept of an inner circle of Odin or Vodin worshippers. And as time went on, the religious links became less prominent, and these guys became more like your ordinary warrior of the day. And and, and look, okay, so sounds crazy, sure. Uh, we have to recognize, though, that religious indoctrination can be very powerful. Members of modern cultic organizations can be manipulated into acts they would not commit otherwise. So I think there's some sand to this. We just don't know how far it goes into the, like the, the physiological aspects of the legend. Well, and Ben, you, you mentioned also that some of these folks maybe were not exactly the cream of the crop in terms of their ability to do other things, uh, which you likely could interpret as mental health issues. Yeah. uh, Perhaps developmental issues of some kind. Uh, And then because of the lack of sensitivity around those sorts of things, they're like, oh, you're perfect. Let's Mm -hmm. beef you up, big boy, you know? Yeah, this is the sticky one. This is more controversial, but there are scholars arguing Berserker were handpicked on the basis of what we today would recognize as mental health issues. The argument is like, let's say there are people, there are people in the community who have what we will call schizotypal conditions, right? Schizophrenia, disassociative disorders, and so on. And then the argument is that instead of executing them for witchcraft or lycanthropy, the way so much of Europe later did, uh, the leaders of these communities would say, heck yeah, man, you really are an animal and I've got a job for you. Yeah, dude, let's, okay. It goes back to psychological warfare, both exterior that we're talking about with the myth, but and interior, right? Bringing some, like really creating something like that a monster uh, <laughs> yeah uh, like your own golem, but it's a human being that just has, you know, suffers from dissociative states. That is also really strong. It's I not your if they fault. Ever turned on their masters. Of course, yeah. it's not your fault, bro. You were a bear at the time. <laughs> like that, well, that, I'm laughing because it's so uncomfortable. But I could, I can see that functioning with these these two religious fervor plus these mental health issues. If only you could add one more thing: law and order, Vikings. Bum, bum, bum. It's interesting, too. I mean, again, we're talking about all these pop culture touch points, but like in the uh, God of War, most recent God of War game, Valhalla Rising, like one of the characters turns into a bear. That's like there, you know, there there are a lot of transformations into animals, but one of the really powerful ones is turning into a bear. The the proper word for lycanthropy, what is it? Theorantropy or something like that. Uh, Shapeshifting, belief in shapeshifting. It's not just werewolfery. It's any type Mm -hmm. of shapeshifting. Yeah. Got whether it. so like skinwalkers too in across the pond, but um in whether that is a metaphorical, metaphysical shape changing or indeed physiological shape changing, the belief is quite common in all the cultures in these regions at this time. And this is where, to your point, Matt, um, and to your earlier foreshadowing, Noel, this is where we add the third ingredient to the recipe, the idea of drugs the idea that these guys were normal folks until they got into the ritualistic ingestion of particular forms of hallucinogen or psychedelic it could it's often described like you mentioned henbane a lot of scholars will say um it could be a combination of herbs or mushrooms ingested in sort of a, a pre-battle 
amped up ceremony. Yeah. So like right before you play a sports game, you get in the huddle. <laughs> uh, Almost uh, like ayahuasca with that altered state, but not not super the same, aggro. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not not looking for self actualization. But imagine <laughs> the ritualization of something like that. That's oh, yeah. why I'm thinking the ayahuasca rituals, uh, where it's something that's very spiritual. It's something you do, and then. You're off to the races. Yeah, that was depicted in the in the Norseman too. The Northman too. There was a scene where they do a ritual using this stuff uh, and it's, bark it's, like dogs. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And vulva, uh, vulva is or vulva, vulva. Uh, so anyway, there is a shamanistic class in Viking culture. These are what we would call the holy folks, the seers or the seeresses, and. Um, there is historical precedent because we do know that that class ritualistically ingested uh, hallucinogenic substances to arrive at a greater spiritual understanding. They were soothsayers. They were clairvoyants. According to their communities, they participated in the non-material world. But there's, I, I think there's logical leap there because none of those substances have been found within the bodies of, uh, with like ingested in the bodies of these warriors. They may have been buried with them to uh, show that they had an appreciation of that shamanistic class. But is it not kind of like a future historian saying in 20th century American society, some people did LSD and cocaine. Therefore, all Marines were always on LSD and cocaine. It's kind of like, I think there's a little too much red string connection there. Yeah, no, I feel you. Um, so what, does it feel to you guys like the religious argument is maybe the strongest? Because we know how that can really transform the mind and make you fear, fearless, you know, if it's uh, weaponized in that way. Maybe. I, I'm thinking, I haven't seen the Northman yet, guys. Oh, and it's, it's so good. It's dude. very good. It's, it's time. Working. Also, Valhalla Rising, the Nicholas Winding Refn movie, is also about That's the same kind of air. It's yeah. also quite good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking at a clip from The Northman where mm -hmm. Bjork apparently Bjork plays. Yep. Mm -hmm. She plays one of those witches called the mm -hmm. Whispering Cirrus. Yes. Where they, I think that's what you're describing here. At least that's what mm -hmm. I'm, the imagery at least is is lo uh, looking like that to me. Yeah. Um, and I'm just imagining someone like that in your. In, not inner circle, right? But someone in t in your village, in your city where you live, would that person would appear to have lots of power, especially depending on preconceived notions and beliefs about you know all of that stuff. I can see that manipulation totally being a thing. And now they're paying attention to you. Yes, uh, and they've got a mission not. for you. <laughs> Weird audio podcast if no one saw yeah, the really in. cool move I did <laughs> on awesome. camera. But the uh, there's also a shout out to uh, Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. Damn it. The W's and V's are getting to me. Anyway, he's also one of those examples. And there were the idea of these shamans. Um, it was primarily female led, but there were male identifying or non-binary shamans in the mix. That is proven. That's part of historical record. If you are that person... Uh, if you are considering a career in berserkery, uh, there's one thing you have to know. And I think this is a piece of the puzzle that informs our episode. It wasn't a career for a lot of these guys. What if going berserker was not an all the time vocation? Uh, Peter Pence, again, one of the best sources here, he notes that it may have been an initiation ritual. It may mm. have been a thing you did once to get your stripes, to make your bones, oh. to join the gang. So like, hey, you want to be down with us? You really Are you really cool with the God of War, my guy? If so, you can fight with us. But the first time, you got to be naked. Yeah, We don't make the rules. Sorry, we don't make the rules. That's God's call. Well, yeah, you have to do this ritual and embody the God of War, and then you're in. That's fascinating to me. I could, I could see that. As a thing, or just at least someone who's chosen, right? You, again, I'm going back to thinking, thinking about that person, that special person chooses you for this mission. Um, and maybe it is just to get in, but maybe it's also a special thing that like almost a self-sacrifice. Oh, like, I see, I see, I see, I see. I don't know. I don't know. A passage, uh, a passage to a higher socioeconomic status. And if you die, a one-way ticket to Valhalla. 
and not everybody gets to go to the good death. But if you don't, you're rewarded here, right? Yeah, yeah. You can get more freelance gigs uh, in the proto Blackwater or Academi or XE, uh, or for more stability, you can, like we said earlier, be a bodyguard for the political class. Yeah. And your and then your main job becomes uh, being the dude who stands behind the jarl or the king and just makes crazy eyes. Oh, and psychological warfare because it's now there are tales now of you, this berserker that went into battle and slayed all these people, and now all you got to do, as you said, Ben, is stand behind the jarl, and everybody who looks at the jarl sees you, and they go, "Oh crap, I yeah. know who that is." <laughs> And then you just yes and the crazy stories. They're like, did you really kill all those people and eat their livers? And then you just grunt. God. And and it's and it it functions to protect the king, the you know, the person running the place without actually having to do anything further. So what do we think? Have we uh, have we laid out a good case? I mean, I think so. I'm freaked out that that music has such an effect on me internally. I don't like this. I don't want to have been a berserker in a past life, guys. Oh, <laughs> man. You got some bodies on those two hands, Matty. Uh, I, d- <laughs> I Te- hope not. Technically, Noel is, I don't want to put you on the spot, bro, but technically, yes. I believe you're the most Nordic. Yeah, I was once a young German boy. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I would say with all this in mind, we can reasonably conclude at the very least the following. Something like Berserkir was real, operating both before and during the age of the Vikings. They probably did not have superpowers. They were not some weird ancestor of Marvel super soldier serum. I personally do think the story is more interesting if they were hopped up on some kind of drug, but uh, we we don't have hard proof. That's not, not to say it didn't happen. It's just to say that there isn't a lot of documentation about it. Well, I, I, I think too, that the combined with the religious fervor angle, the mental illness angle is very interesting because, you know, there's all kinds of stories about folks who thought they were communicating with God, but it turns out they may have had schizophrenia or so. We've talked about that on the show recently. So can you imagine if someone like that was manipulated and like, you know, browbeaten into believing that they were communicating with God and that those voices were voices telling them to kill for the gods that could be turned by Bjork Mm -hmm. at the very least. He got Bjorked. Uh They could have. They could have called them Bjorkers. Mm-hmm. Whatever. There you go. Uh, so, that's good. Uh, so what? What seems most likely then is that the combatants called Berserker today, uh, they were their ranks were probably composed of young men seeking wealth and status in society, possibly through intensely dangerous positions in raids. In most cases, they were not planning to make a career out of doing this every weekend. There were exceptions to the rules, probably. Your short career. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, there were warlords. There were there are always a couple of, as they would say, bad apples. Uh, but one of the best pieces for the evidence of the existence of berserkers comes in 1015. Jarl Eriker Hakarnason and uh, Gragas, the... Uh, uh, medieval Icelandic stuff, they had a code of law that made it illegal to be berserkir. And that means that they did really exist. There's also a huge, like, stolen valor aspect to this, where, like, it's really good for your job if you're a raider to have it be believed that you were berserkir. Uh, anyway, I think these, the thing is, these exceptions. They make a better story than the truth. That's what their enemies latch on to when they write these history books. And perhaps the best lesson in 2024 is that we see a very common thing, an all too common thing. Power structures can, will, and do manipulate the vulnerable into very dangerous positions. Sign up, right? Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. What did, which one did we use that in? What Was that 13 Days? We used that in... No, we used it in uh, one of the things you wrote for this show, right? Oh, uh, um, maybe. It's... Uh, it, the, the English is, it is both sweet and fitting to die for one's country. It's, a, it's an old war poem. 
gosh, I, I know, but I swear, I swear you've used it in something that we did that was fictional, that was awesome, and I can't remember it right now. It's I a, overuse it. I it's love an it. Easter it's such egg. a banger. It's an yeah. Easter egg somewhere that somebody's going to find. Um, I, I think it also is a lesson about the psychological warfare that these same groups will use, right? Uh, not about not just to get someone to become a berserker or get someone to go on a mission like that, but using fear to control the uh, up the opposition, right? Um, internal and external fear, I think. Agreed. And perhaps these are the things the modern world doesn't want you to know. But you know what we want to know, folks? We want to know your thoughts. Uh, we can't wait to hear your stories of other uh, legendary fighting groups. Tell us if you think they got a short shrift. Tell us if any of the legends are true. We try to be easy to find online. Correct. You can find us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook, on X, FKA Twitter, and on YouTube, where you can find new video content coming out every single week. And boy, do we have some doozies coming your way. Uh, on Instagram and TikTok, you can find us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. As we said at the top, if you liked this episode, head back to October 2020 and listen to our two-part series on assassins. It's, uh, they're, they're excellent. Listen to them both because the story flows all the way through the thing. We also have a phone number. It's 1-833-STDWYTK. It's a voicemail. You've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your voice on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in that message, why not instead send us an email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.